I want to thank you all for coming. We're going to make a brief slide presentation. And uh, being a professor, you know, this presentation could go on for hours, but it is not going to do that. We want to move through some of the issues, tell you where we've come since we first started the Safe Energy Project, and tell you how you can help us, because we can't do this work alone. So we're very appreciative that so many of you have come out this evening. I'm going to turn this over to my dear friend. I've known Ronaldo Brudico since the mid-'80s where we worked together and we first met and recognized we had a passion about energy. So uh, I want to turn this over to Ronaldo in one minute. Um, is Lala here? No, right here. Okay. Uh, so so let, me, let me just make one other point and then I'm going to turn this over to Ronaldo. When I first met Cesar Chavez and worked with him, my first incarnation in California many, many years ago, he said, you know what the first thing you have to do to organize? I said, no. What is that? He says, organize your family. If your family is not behind what you're doing, your work will never happen. So whoever you see, whether it's me or Julie or Lala or Ronaldo, we're all working together on this. And Lala um, is right there with Ronaldo, shoulder and shoulder. And Julie's been with me since 1978 on these particular issues. So I want to acknowledge them as well. Yay! Yay. Get this out of the way. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, some of you know, and this is we'll, we'll do this very quickly, the World Business Academy is an organization I founded in 1986. It's a nonprofit, 501c3. And from that day to this, I've spent anywhere between 25 to 30 hours a week working in the public interest on a vast range of issues, which hopefully you'll come to hear more about over time. Uh, the Academy has continuously published endless numbers of articles, books, on a wide variety of subjects, including corporate governance, uh, cutting edge of business ethics, how can business be responsible for having positive impact on society, and on and on and on. The reason for tonight, though, is because a little over 15 years ago, we started a thing called the Energy Task Force. And when we started, we were initially looking at what it took to get a stable energy future. And none of us were energy experts at that point. But we became concerned with what we saw in the Middle East, and we wondered what the implications of that were. And we started digging into it. And as business people, when you start to dig into something where you think you have what's called a risk exposure, uh, it leads you from one question to the next and to the next. And out of that work, the Energy Task Force, we've spun many different things. One of the things we spun was our renewable energy section, which has become one of the, really the leaders in the world in renewable energy technology. You've never heard of any renewable technology that exists anywhere on the planet that we haven't studied exhaustively and probably published on. Uh, we, our last book that Jerry and I did with another author uh, about seven years ago was a compendium on that. And which, by the way, the main recommendation of that book called Midi uh, Freedom from Mid East Oil was that if you want to really move the needle, change the CAFE fuel standards, which is exactly what the government did. It's had an enormous impact. And you'll begin to see now the dependence on oil is going to plummet over the next five to seven years. Now, one of the things that did come out of also, though, <laughs> Jerry and I first met, as he said, in the mid 80s, we both developed an interest in nuclear which uh, kind of was parallel to our energy task force work. And then in uh, 1997, we published our first book on nuclear, Jerry and I, uh, which was a uh, textbook, a college textbook that Simon & Schuster published called uh, Profiles in Power, uh, which was really an analysis of the nuclear movement, both from the technological and from the sociological point of view. So the interest that we've had individually, Jerry and I, in nuclear goes back even predates the Energy Task Force. But as the Energy Task Force worse went forward, as we became more and more alert to what the renewable energy technologies were possible of, you'll hear a little bit about that tonight, and as we became more clear as to what we could do, safe energy became a clearer and clearer objective. So what safe energy is, is we launched this as a project, and Jerry agreed to take a leave of absence from his, where he's Professor Emeritus in Florida, to come out for a year and help us really launch this and get this going. We reported to you in May, okay, we, we, we reported to you we had several goals. We said the first one was we wanted to close San Onofre nuclear plant. <coughs> And as some of you know, the World Business Academy is comprised of business people who actually write paychecks every two weeks. So we're, we're very business and numbers oriented. We're very practical people. And um, what we looked at was nobody was looking at the numbers on San Onofre. And so we teamed up with a number of environmental groups that you'll see on the screen in a moment. 
and we said, okay, we'll help with the environmental side, but what we really want to focus on is the numbers don't seem to make any sense. And we began to pursue how you could bring Edison to, to basically to, to focus on the public interest if the PUC at the, up until that point had not been willing to do so. So it's closed, and it was closed for financial reasons. And uh, we believe many of the same financial reasons will apply ultimately to Diablo Canyon, by the way. Um, the second thing we did is we said we want to recoup over $4 billion for ratepayers. So we have right now, I just gave my last uh, set of testimony uh, for the Public Utilities Commission was filed on September 10th, so very recently, where we had to analyze this unbelievably voluminous stack of absolute nonsense. <laughs> that Edison gave us to look at. I, I, in fact, at one point in my testimony, I said, uh, and I have a certain number of credentials in the finance area and whatnot, and I said, you know, as a, as a financial expert, I can, the only word I can think of to describe this is gobbledygook. <laughs> it was literally gobbledygook. And, and the thing that's amazing is that s people aren't paying attention to it. So we're currently suing at the PUC level. We're pushing for, on behalf of the public, 1.3 billion dollars of refunds and I will be really disappointed if we don't get north of 800 to a billion. I mean I'm willing to compromise a little. We're also trying to stop if you can believe it. We're being charged as ratepayers 83 million dollars a month for a plant that will never again ever produce electricity which stopped producing electricity in January 2012 and where they have no intention of stopping charging us. We're also trying to stop a $3.2 billion charge for, for basically dismantling a plant which has already been charged to over a billion and a half dollars to us and which we know can be closed for a lot less. So the, the amount of um, theft going on here, and I think it is theft frankly, I was sharing with Gary Becker who like me shares the, uh, the background of having been an attorney. Uh, I'm, I'm in recovery. I think Gary is also at this point. And uh, you know there's, there's that great line from The Godfather where, he's, where the Godfather is explaining to his son why he relies on his conciliare so much and he says, son, one lawyer with a briefcase can steal more than 12 men with guns. <laughs> and Edison is full of briefcases. Full of them. So that's what we're doing. Launch the campaign. I never worked for Edison. I'm really glad, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, didn't, I drew the line there, too. Um, the other thing we're doing is we said we wanted to launch a campaign to close Diablo Canyon. You're going to be hearing a lot more about Diablo Canyon in a minute. That launched in fall of 2013. And we said we wanted to present an, a solution. So if we're going to close all these things, and for those of you who haven't seen our work, we've actually presented a diagram to the Rotary Club here about a month or so ago where we showed that according to the California Independent System Operator, we don't need Diablo, Canyon, or San Onofre for power. In fact, if you look at the power source officially compiled by the state of California, it shows that we not only have excess capacity for peak, but we have excess on top of the peak. And it's only after that that you get to nuclear. So there, this is an insane amount of money we're being taxed for, for a facility that's inherently dangerous. You'll hear about more of it. And we said, okay, if we're going to do that, what we have to do is give the state of California a comprehensive program for what it can do for energy in the future. We know it doesn't need nuclear today. We want it to switch off of not only nuclear, but our, uh, which we will be presenting to the Public Utilities Commission in the long-term power procurement hearings in 2014, is actually a formula to convert the entire state of California off of all carbon-based fuels, all, within 10 years or less, at no additional cost to the ratepayer. Now, show of hands, if we can convert California <laughs> off of carbon-based and nuclear fuel at no additional cost to the rate period, other than inflation, how many of you would want us to do that? Right? I mean, come on, it's a no-brainer. So all we have to do is show them how and then proceed to, to create the community support, which is what this meeting's about, so that we can start to get that to happen. Because it's imminently doable with the technology, so you'll get to that point in a second. So. Here's what we closed. This, it's closed permanently as of June 7th. It'll never run again. It's still charging like it's open. In fact, they put in for a premium, but it's closed. Uh, uh, you already heard that the um, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility was involved with us. Uh, Mothers, of course, in San, in San Luis Obispo. Turn, Friends of the Earth. We joined together with them. They did most of the environmental stuff because we were supposed to do the other thing. We worked together on a variety of pleadings and all through the hearings. I'm, I'm sorry to say that at this point some of the groups like Friends of the Earth have decided that closing the plant was the victory. So they've returned to Washington. They're no longer going to be involved. And we continue to be, the World Business Academy continues to be the only business group asking for refunds and money. And we will continue to do that. 
uh, and with your support, hopefully, we'll be successful. So um, this is basically what we wanted to do on San Onofre. I mentioned the 3.2 billion. I talked about the one point. Now it's 1.3 since we did this slide. We don't want to pay the 83 million anymore, and we're the only business group actively trying to get the money back to all of us. Now, here's our solution for the future. It turns out hydrogen, and the Germans are further ahead than we are right now, hydrogen can be produced without subsidies at a cost equal to $3.75 a gallon of gas. Let me repeat that. We can produce hydrogen, which has the same energy output as a gallon of gas for $3.75 without subsidy. Now, when you can do that, it permits something really magical to happen. We can literally empower communities across California at the substation level. We can say, how would you like to choose? Would you like to choose to keep getting dirty energy, or would you like to have a, a clean fuel cell sitting there powering your homes on your two or three square blocks? And I'm, I'm pleased to report that we have five cities that have taken us up on this offer. San Francisco, Davis, Palo Alto, Sonoma, the fifth one escapes me at the moment, uh, are all standing in line who now want us to do what's called the, the, the Green, their Cool City Challenge. And we're teamed up with, uh, we're doing that in conjunction with some other people, which is on the next slide, right? Um, and what we're doing is we're basically literally going to try and change people's approach to power consumption block by block. So we're not going to ask the state to, dis to, 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 to unplug all of its wires, although ultimately they will. I'll give you one statistic. Every high power transmission line in California loses 40% of its energy between the point where they make it and the point where you use it. 40 Can you imagine what we could do with 40% more energy we already paid for? So if you do that at the fuel cell level, at the station level, it turns out we have the ability to create abundant fuels that will power our economy, power our transportation or vehicles, and do it with absolutely zero pollution. All of that hydrogen can come from 100% renewable sources like wind, photovoltaic, and geothermal. So dramatically reduce CO2 pollution is what we want to do. We want to commercialize hydrogen fuel cells. The Germans are way ahead of us, but I think we can really catch up. And we want to transform the consciousness around energy and climate change. Okay. Now, to do that, we teamed up with the Chopra Foundation, who's launched the Consciousness Project. We teamed up with the Empowerment Institute, which is run by David Gerzon, and who's doing the Cool City Challenge, and the World Business Academy Safe Energy Project. We wrapped them all up into a, into a giant um, new consortium, and that's what's going to be proposing this solution, not only from a technological point of view, we'll show them how to do the hydrogen, we're actually going to show them how we're going to turn the blocks off one at a time, and we've been given our first block is a couple of blocks in the inner sunset of San Francisco. By the end of November this year, we get our first one. So we're rolling. It's And with your help, one day Santa Barbara. And I will just leave you with one last thought. You know, uh, when I was a young man, it, I realized that that quote, it, it, it really made an impression on me, was I can't do everything, but what I, but I can do something. And then what I can do, by the grace of God, I will do. So everybody's capable of something. Everybody here in the room. And what I'd ask you to do is start thinking about the fact that we have more power than we realize. If we act together, we can have rational solutions for our energy. We can have safe energy. We can have affordable energy. And we can take a lot of power back to ourselves. Because why did we let it get so far afield in the first place? Thanks very much for coming. So we are joining in a coalition with the Mothers for Peace, the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility, and several other groups uh, to institute a campaign to close Diablo Canyon. It's a major risk for the Central Coast. Um, what do we want to avoid? Unfortunately, it's easy to say. Let's point to po across the Pacific and look at the ongoing international disaster of Fukushima. Just today, there was another earthquake uh, in southern Japan. This is an ongoing issue. They have lost control of the reactor. It is leaking 100,000 gallons a day of contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean. All bluefin tuna tested recently in California waters had high levels of radiation. The American Medical Association has called for the federal testing of all U.S. seafood, especially edible Pacific fish, 
for radiation levels. This is truly an international disaster, and this is what happens when the atom gets out of control. This is why nuclear power is the most expensive form of energy. It's the most dangerous, and even with the money that goes into it, the unpredictable can happen. These are the kind of things that, in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in this world of nuke speak, they tell us, oh, this won't happen for one in 10 million reactor years, but when it happens, it happened. This is the footprint of Fukushima from Jet Propulsion Labs, the first four days of the radiation plume overlaid over Diablo Canyon. If it were at the epicenter, you are here. And there is, unfortunately, pockets of radiation in the Pacific coming across that will hit Baja California, that will hit the coast of California, that's predicted in 2014. I have a wonderful job. Make your life really happy, huh? Um, why we're concerned for health reasons, we're concerned for security reasons, we're concerned for economic reasons. And this, we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. And the major piece of legislation that he passed shortly before he was assassinated was the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I'm from, I've lived 40 years in Miami Beach, Florida, and I've lived in a home that had a bomb shelter for the cellar. Why? Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, almost as close as we ever have come to the brink of nuclear war. Why is it that one year after that crisis, President Kennedy was able to reach through the Iron Curtain, shake hands with Premier Khrushchev, and agree to stop all above ground and underwater nuclear testing? It's because of these words the loss of even one human life or the malformation of one baby who may be born long after we are gone should be of concern to all of us. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics towards which we can be indifferent, nor does this affect the nuclear powers alone. These tests befoul the air of all men and all nations, the committed and the uncommitted alike, and without their knowledge and without their consent. And this was passed because President Kennedy was aware that radioactive strontium-90, a man-made transuranic isotope that only comes out of bombs and uh, nuclear fission uh, reaction, was coming into the atmosphere from the bomb tests. And along with it, in articles that were published in Science at that time, uh, childhood leukemia, childhood cancer were grow going up, children, adult aspirin, children's aspirin. Children are more vulnerable to all drugs, to all toxins, and they're unfortunately the canaries in the mine shaft when it comes to toxic exposure, as Rachel Carson pointed out many, many years ago. So the test ban treaty in 1963, and then strontium-90 as measured in baby teeth, because the body interprets strontium as calcium, takes it up into the bones and into the teeth. Strontium-90 started dropping and this is from the first baby teeth study, which actually was funded by the U.S. Public Health Service. Now, nuclear power, bomb testing is over. Nuclear power expands dramatically. And here's what happens. Instead of going down to non-detectable, strontium-90 starts turning up. What most people do not realize is that nuclear power plants are routinely allowed to release amounts of radioactivity into the air, into the vapors, and they could not function without that. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission tells us it is safe, it is not. Um, California's Rancho Seco nuclear power plant, uh, this was closed, and this to me is one of the most compelling arguments uh, about the relationship between radiation and cancer. This plant was closed by a local initiative in the 20 years that followed, and this is data from the California Cancer Registry, incidence of childhood cancer drops dramatically. Incidence of thyroid cancer in Sacramento County drops dramatically. And this has happened, according to public health data, around every major nuclear power plant that has been closed. This shows you uh, that there are tsunami zones historically in the areas around Diablo Canyon. And these are some of the economic issues. The one right now, they're running about a million gallons of water a day. A billion. A billion. Gallons. Just two a billion. few zeros off. One, two billion. One billion for each reactor. One billion for each reactor. Through that reactor, the state has mandated that has to stop. Um, 
the seismic updates, the fact that the California independent system operator said, we don't even need Diablo Canyon to have reliable energy. It is not a must run facility. We believe that these economic arguments will eventually prevail uh, in the case of Diablo Canyon as they did with San Onofre. How is all of this happening? How do we do our work? We support this effort with a loan guarantee by an affiliate of the World Business Academy. I won't mention any names here, but this is how all of our work has been launched. Um, we are applying to receive money back to cover our legal and expert costs under the remedies given by the California Public Utility Commission. That's a six to nine month process at, at best. We are going to look for local and statewide foundation grants for our Diablo Canyon campaign and for our hydrogen solution campaign. That, as many of you who are here involved with nonprofits, that's a six to nine month process. We right now have online an Indiegogo campaign, a crowdfunding campaign, to raise $12,000 so that Isaac and his team can make a film to get the word out about nuclear power, radiation, and America's cancer epidemic. As of today, we're at $9,400. This is not a fundraising meeting, but if you would like to help us get over the top <laughs> by Saturday, go see Nancy Black at the end of this meeting, and she will be happy to help you in that. We are, in order to bring some ongoing capital, and we're looking to raise over $100,000 to keep moving this operation forward until these longer term funding uh, scenarios can materialize, we're doing a lunch at the Fest Parker on December 3rd. And Nikki Richardson is coordinating that, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about how that works. Uh, the one last thing I'd like to say, and speak with David if you need more information, is that Diablo Canyon has tremendously high seismic risk. There are major, multiple major earthquake faults in the area. It's one of the worst places in the world you could have ever built a nuclear reactor. And uh, Richard Peck, a senior NRC inspector at Diablo Canyon, had said this plant is not in compliance with its operating license. So there are many reasons to want to close Diablo Canyon. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, show of hands, who likes to ask their friends for money? <laughs> no one? One. Okay, I'm with you there. <laughs> okay, show of hands, who likes to um, be asked for money? No, no takers. I didn't think so. So, but we all give, right? The, in the United States economy, $250 billion was donated. And 80% of that money came from individuals like us, right? The rest, the 20% is distributed over foundations. Businesses give about 8%. Foundations give about maybe 8%. And then there's a little bit here and there. So 80% comes from people like us, OK? And so, but no one likes to give money. And no one likes to be asked for money. And no one likes to ask for money. So how do we get people to give money willingly? <laughs> right? That's the big dilemma. So, um, and it's really is, fundraising is not, it's 90% science, 10% art. Education is a big component, yes. And so the reception that we're doing in December is basically around education. It's a complimentary lunch. Um, it'll be, it's an hour long. We ask you to come at 11.45 so that you can be checked in, so we can start on the, t on the dot. Believe me when I tell you I am militant about that one hour, because people will not remember what you said, but they will remember that, wow, she said one hour. 11, 12.59, I'm saying thank you for coming and have a nice day. So that is our goal, is to get you in and out of there in an hour. But during that one hour, we have you a captive audience, you and your friends, whomever you might choose to invite. And that's what we're asking for tonight, is that we're asking you to partner with us, not to ask your friends for money. That's not your job. Because you don't like to do it anyway, and you're not going to do a good job of it because you don't know what to say. That's our job. And we do it in a very diplomatic, very discreet way. Basically, our job is to provide you with information that stirs, that moves you, that hits you here and makes you say how much. If we do our job right, then the people in the room will give us the money that we need to make this all happen. So we're inviting you to host a table. It's complimentary. 
There's no charge. There's no auction. There's no raffle. There's no boring entertainment. There's no things to buy that you're never going to use, but you're buying anyway because you have to support the charity. None of that. We're just asking you for one hour of your time. You get fed. We promise you it'll be good, even though it's Fess Parker and that's questionable sometimes. <laughs> But that's, that's really it. That's the gist of it. It's, it's a, um, I've done this for another organization here locally, and we've done two such receptions at Fest Parker, and in, we've raised, we raised $350,000 in cash and multiple year pledges because people were so bonded to the cause and the mission because we didn't sell them on it. We involved, we educated them. We empowered them to, to, to make a choice. They made a choice to give to us that day. It's actually how I met Ronaldo. He is one of the donors of that foundation. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> the one success story that I'll leave you with is this woman who came up to me after the first lunch that we did where we raised $156,000 for a very, some people would call an unsexy cause in town. And um, she came up to me and she said, I want you to know that I came not knowing anything about your organization. I was invited by a table captain, and I came intending not to give you a penny. But she signed up to be a thousand dollar a year donor for five years. And that is the power of this lunch. Thank you for your time. Thank you.